All right, we'll give it a couple more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Um, my name is Will Steinberger. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Michigan. I work with our imaging team. Uh, and today we're going, I'm going to be presenting on introduction to detectors. So a uh, bit of background on this. Oh. There we go, bit of background on this. Why are we interested in radiation detection? Uh, here, I've just broken it down into three subcategories that we can apply radiation detection for. So first one, uh, health and medical applications. Uh, one, uh, a major issue here in Michigan, for instance, is radon buildup in basements and issues in other places as well. So where radiation detection can help us is monitoring that buildup and how we can mitigate that. Of course, as Chris presented yesterday, there's also huge medical applications of uh, radiation imaging um, and detection. So for instance, if we have positron emission tomography, for instance, PET, where they um, put a positron source in you and image that, we have to have a method for detecting those 511 KEV uh, photons that leave you and be able to reconstruct that. 
Um, it's also can be used for uh, reactor monitoring, for verifying power levels, for monitoring reactor period, things of that nature. Um, and finally, our major uh, application for it is non-proliferation. So you can see here, um, these are images from the IAEA, um, where inspectors are verifying fuel. And then um, at the bottom right here, you can see one of the IAEA online enrichment monitoring um, systems that they have. So let's break down detection a little bit. So breaking down detection. So the first thing is, uh, what are we trying to detect? So there's a slew of particles we can detect, but there are four major ones that we're going to focus on and we're going to actually narrow this down to just two. So alpha particles, um, beta particles, and then photons and neutrons. Both alpha particles and beta particles are charged particles. Um, alpha particles are much larger than uh, and heavier than beta particles, which is effectively an electron. Um, and, but since both are charged particles, uh, they constantly lose energy moving through any type of medium. Uh, therefore, the range of these particles is not that significant. Uh, most alpha particle and beta particles, uh, if you have a source, don't necessarily even make it out of the source. Uh, so you can't really detect them at range. The two particle types that we're going to ma majority focus on here, photons and neutrons, you can detect out um, at significant range because these particles um, are not charged and they're highly penetrating. So we have these two particles and we want to be able to detect them. And we need to detect them through some kind of medium. Um, and this medium needs to produce some kind of information carriers uh, that we can use. So for instance, uh, list out some information carriers here. Uh, we can have photons. Uh, these are from scintillators. And this is general, generally in the visible light spectrum that we're detecting. You can also have charge carriers, so such as a semiconductor or gaseous detector. A semiconductor is going to be electron hole pairs. For gaseous, it's generally going to be electron ion pairs. And then even there are some applications with calorimeters where they're detecting phonons. Um, at uh, millikelvin ranges, very, very interesting detectors um, that we can use to be able to detect these different types of radiation. Once we have a detection medium and we get these information carriers, we need to be able to do something with that. We need to have some kind of response. And this can be an analog response um, in terms of an analog counter or um, a channel analyzer or what is more frequently being used today is digitization, where uh, we can see that we acquire some waveform or a scintillation pulse in this case that you're seeing at the bottom here that gives us some information about uh, what interaction occurred with our detector. And then we can take this response and we can process it and we can get all kinds of energy information, timing information, particle identification, things of that nature that can be useful for whatever our application really is. So going further into this, so this is just a generalized idea of radiation detection, but what are some actual detectors that are out there? Um, I've broken this down into three subcategories. Of course, this is not all encompassing. And as I'll discuss, there is overlap between the three. But this is to just give you a general idea of some of the detectors that are out there. The first type I'm going to start with on the left are gaseous detectors. Um, if any of you have seen a movie or you all are probably familiar with Geiger counters at this point, the clicking sound that corresponds to radiation being uh, radiation interacting with the detector. We'll briefly touch on Geiger counters in a minute, but these are very common detectors. They're relatively old detectors but they still serve a good purpose um, where we have any type of ionizing radiation coming in, interacting with the detector and then getting a response out. Um, semiconductor detectors. Um, here I have shown high purity, a high purity germanium detector. And then of course, uh, being part of MTV and CZT, I couldn't not show a pixelated cadmium zinc telluride detector there. Um, these detectors uh, tend to have very good spectroscopic capability, such that they uh, can identify gamma rays emitted from specific sources very well. Um, 
and I've linked here a paper from Professor He's group for pixelated uh, cadmiums and telluride uh, with more details about these types of detectors. Uh, finally, uh, we also have scintillator based detectors. So these are detectors where you have some kind of medium that ionizing radiation comes in, interacts with, produces photons, and those photons are then collected through some kind of photo detector. Um, in this case, uh, the medium is called the scintillator. These can be organic or inorganic. Uh, and then the photo detectors, there are more than these, but the two we're going to focus on are photomultiplier tubes and silicon photomultiplier tubes. Um, for our group and moving forward, we majority focus on proportional counters and then scintillation based detectors or scintillator based detectors. So for the following portion of the lecture, um, these are the two areas that we're going to focus on. And the first one being proportional counters. So proportional counters uh, are gas filled detectors that rely on gas multiplication, the gas multiplication phenomena when charged particles um, interact with it. Um, so you can see the basic breakdown of a proportional counter or gas filled detector here, where you have an anode wire surrounded by some kind of cathode cylinder around it, where the interior here is filled with a gas, and then we have some uh, voltage bias uh, across the detector. And the voltage bias uh, gives us our collection mechanism. So when we have a charged particle or some kind of interaction with our detector that produces a charged particle, that particle can go and create electron atom pairs. By having the bias across the detector, it allows those uh, electron ion pairs to induce charge in our detector that we can then detect. And what do I mean by that? So if you look at this plot here on the right, uh, let's say if we have just a one MeV charged particle interacting with our detector. Um, depending on our voltage, we're going to get a different response from our detector. Um, so what this means, and we've got a couple region regions here. So the first region that isn't labeled is the recombination region. This is where our detector doesn't have sufficient voltage uh, to be able to actually fully separate all the charge out and have it induce um, an effect on our detector. The second region is where it does um, have the ability to maintain that charge separation and be able to acquire it. This is the ion saturation region. Uh, we then move into the proportional region um, where proportional counters uh, tend to operate. And this is where we're gener we have such an applied voltage that the electric field is actually allowing um, electrons uh, to produce additional electron ion pairs. It's accelerating them enough to create more charge. And that's why you can see here for the one MeV, which has a constant pulse amplitude in this region, begins to have a higher pulse amplitude, even though the energy is staying the same. Um, so this is the main region that we're focusing on. And as you increase voltage even more, eventually you get into the Geiger region. And this, what's happening in this region is that charge particle interaction is basically uh, producing enough charge particles, uh, electron ion pairs throughout it, that you're depleting the electric field to the point where it can't produce any more, such that the counter is completely firing all that it can which is why uh, the 1 MeV and 2 MeV uh, pulse amplitudes converge there. So looking at this in a bit more detail, um, so a visualization of the electric field here uh, in the proportional counter, where we can have a particle interact with this, begin to, in terms of the electrons, which are going to go towards the anode, begin to move towards the anode. And as they're moving through the electric field, they're picking up energy. And there's some region uh, around the anode wire where this multiplication effect begins to happen. And you can see uh, here, this is a simulated avalanche uh, in a proportional counter that was performed uh, using a Monte Carlo method. So you can kind of get an idea of the different tracks and visualize that multiplication that occurs in this counter such that we get a sufficient response to be able to detect it.
Now, I mentioned that uh, this is one of the detectors that we're going to be focusing on. So the question is, why are we focusing particularly on this detector? So um, proportional counters, there are many types of proportional counters, but one of them that uh, we have used and that is traditionally used is a helium-3 proportional counter. So helium-3 has been a byproduct from the weapons program. It comes from tritium decay. Um, and it has, and one of the reasons we really like it is it has a huge thermal neutron cross-section. So it's a fantastic uh, thermal neutron detector. On top of that, as Chris dis discussed yesterday, gamma ray interactions are largely dependent on density and the uh, Z of the material. Helium-3 being not very dense and having a very low Z um, makes it very insensitive to gamma rays. So this detector is a type of detector that is effectively insensitive or has very low sensitivity to gamma rays and very high sensitivity to thermal neutrons. And you can see over here, um, I have the interaction equation uh, written down where we have the helium-3 interact with a neutron producing a triton, a tritium atom, and then a free proton and about point MeV of energy is released that is split between these two particles. Um, here you can see this is um, a couple helium-3 tubes, I believe three in our uh, laboratory at Michigan uh, that are surrounded in these uh, white planks. Uh, that is polyethylene. And the reason for that is to slow down the neutrons. So we'll talk about uh, more, we'll talk about moderation and things of that more later and how neutrons interact. Um, but for the purpose of this, uh, so you all are that aware, most neutrons tend to be born with a uh, significant energy. If we look at like a watt spectrum, the average neutron energy is about two MeV. Uh, so uh, the cross section for the interactions, um, so the probability that that neutron is going to interact with helium three is relatively low. But if we can scatter down that neutron so it loses energy, the probability of it then interacting with our detector goes up drastically. So that's one of the reasons um, that they are surrounded by a moderator, in this case polyethylene. And to give you an idea of some of the responses that are out there, so this is taken from a helium-3 paper analysis, I believe in 1964. So these detectors have been around for quite a while, but they, are, they work very nicely for their application. And you can see um, we get a peak uh, that corresponds to the full energy deposition of this reaction, such that we know that we're detecting uh, thermal neutrons with our detector. Um, so, and I have linked um, the paper here at the bottom if anyone is interested. Um, so that's a brief overview of proportional counters. Are there any questions um, before I move on to scintillators? And this is the fun part where I wait, are people typing questions or um, <laughs> or not? And I'll just give it another like 20 seconds. All right, great. So this is um, proportional counters. Um, next, we're going to talk about uh, scintillators. And we're going to begin with organic scintillators. So scintillators, um, what a scintillator is, is it some kind of material that when ionizing radiation interacts with it, that ionizing radiation um, produces some kind of light response. Um, and that you can see, I have two examples here. These are both of EJ200, which is an organic plastic scintillator uh, that we'll talk more about in just a little bit, uh, where we have a six millimeter cube and then we have a two inch cylinder of it. Um, the emission spectrum for this peaks right around 425 nanometers. Um, and you can see both of these are being shown with a UV light to induce that uh, scintillation. Um, 
organic scintillators are very versatile and there comes in a huge arrays of, array of them. Uh, they can be in the form of a liquid. There are crystalline. Um, liquid, uh, the major one is EJ309. Crystal, uh, they're still being anthra and anthracene are the two major ones. Plastic, there's a huge uh, group of plastics. And then uh, it was actually made a a while ago, but it has uh, been remade and restarted is there's an organic glass that um, is very interesting that we're starting to do some research with. Um, generally, these are low atomic number, uh, organic meaning carbon based. So generally, these are all hydrocarbon based, uh, where it's, I believe, by weight percent tends to be about like 40 to 40% hydrogen, 60% carbon, and uh, generally you can have some other random elements in there, but it's majority hydrogen and carbon. Um, and it has a relatively, a density very close to water, about one gram per centimeter cube. Some of them range a bit higher, some of them range a bit lower, but it's all right around one. Um, to note, um, as discussed yesterday, this makes these relatively insensitive to gamma rays since they have a low density and low Z. Um, and the majority gamma ray interaction with these will be Compton scattering. Um, you will get minimal photoelectric absorption, so you generally do not see photo peaks with these. And that'll be discussed more later. Um, what is the uh, thank you? For, what is the significance of the EJ two hundred designation? Ah, uh, excellent question. So EJ um, is the abbreviation used by a company, Elgin. Um, two hundred. I'm not sure exactly where they got the two hundred, but I guess this was one of their first designations uh, for this specific type of material because they do have variants of it, uh, such as EJ two hundred four and EJ two twenty eight. EJ is just referring to the company that um, you can get this from. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about the actual scintillation process for organic scintillators. So when ionizing interaction interacts with the uh, scintillator, this produces a uh, singlet and triplet states. Uh, and this can come from a charged particle either incident on the scintillator. So if you have an alpha or beta particle that let's say is moving through a vacuum and then enters the scintillator, begins to produce these states. Or you can have a recoiled particle, a uh, recoiled electron from Compton scattering or recoiled uh, proton or carbon atom from a neutron scattering. Um, and as I said, these produce uh, what are called singlet and triplet states. Uh, these are states where uh, we have the electrons uh, in, so ah, let me get my words for a second, where we have these electrons move towards excited states. And these are separated, you can see here, by spin. Um, spin is referring to the angular momentum of the electron in that state. Uh, this is a quantum mechanical property, and we're not going to go into uh, huge detail of that here, but uh, talk about some of the more applications of this phenomenon. So you can see here on the right, we have the energy levels um, for the singlet and triplet states. So if we have this charged particle moving through our medium, it's going to produce all of these different states. Um, and you can see here, we have the initial singlet state, and then we have all of these higher order states. Um, luckily for us, generally these higher order states de-excite through radiationless um, internal conversion, and that's on a picosecond level. Um, so these will generally very quickly just immediately go down to the initial singlet state. We can also notice that there are a bunch of substates for each of one of these. These are various vibrational states of the molecules that are not in thermal equilibrium. Um, and again, on a very quick order, these will also lose that energy and vibrational state and come down to uh, the uh, just uh, excited, the singlet's excited states. These then de-excite uh, producing photons um, and generally this is done on the uh, around 425, 420 nanometers. Uh, still being I think actually peaks around 380 nanometers, so towards the blue end of the spectrum. Um, and the de-excitation of these singlet states is known as prompt fluorescence. You also have production of triplet states, which again is the different spin angular momentum 
these tend to be much longer lived. These tend to be on the microsecond to millisecond range. And this is known as phosphorescence. Um, so generally for our detection, we're really going to majority see the singlet states and depending on how long we're acquiring for, we may or may not see any triplet state decays. Occasionally, um, you will get some input from triplet states in two ways. The first one is um, with delayed fluorescence, which occurs when the uh, triplet state actually is thermally excited into a singlet state, um, which gives us some light. But majority of that is going to come from the singlets. And to give you an idea of how many photons are we talking about, generally the light output for um, organic scintillators is around 10,000 photons per MeV of energy deposition. Now I mentioned that there's another method we can get light from the triplet states. And that has to do um, later on in the pulses. So um, gamma rays interact through a majority of Compton scattering where you'll get a recoiled electron. Recoiled electrons tend to have a significant range on the order of up to millimeters, depending on their energy, of course, through your medium. Neutrons interact through majority elastic scattering and you can get uh, both hydrogen recoils, which is effectively a proton recoil, and then carbon recoils. Um, for our uh, analysis, we majority focus on the proton recoils off of the hydrogen um, because uh, the mass of a neutron, mass of a proton are, relative, are roughly the same, um, such that the neutron can transfer all of its energy to the proton and we can see that recoiled event. The range of recoiled protons is much shorter than that of electrons. It's on the micrometer level, um, such that the density of these different states that are created uh, can actually diffuse and interact. And one of the very interesting properties of some organic scintillators is that these triplet states can diffuse and then go through an annihilation process, um, such that as they interact with each other, they produce singlet states that then can quickly de-excite. And what this ends up doing is giving us a different pulse shape. Um, so here I have overlaid a neutron and gamma ray pulse from still beam that's been coupled to, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, a Sensil J-series silicon photomultiplier. And we can see the prompt or initial light from them, the rise time and pulse height is about exactly the same. However, all the delayed light, which is coming from this triplet-triplet uh, diffusion and annihilation, is much greater for this neutron interaction than for this gamma ray interaction. Um, and if you're interested in this more, uh, I've listed here a paper from uh, Natalia uh, Zaitseva, uh, who is a research scientist who works on organic scintillator production uh, that goes into this with much more detail. Um, and she also talks about um, one of the interesting things. So still being is pulse shape discrimination capable in that coupling it to a uh, detector, you can see this difference between neutron and gamma ray pulses. Uh, for reference, EJ200 is not pulse shape discrimination capable. Even though it is an organic scintillator, you cannot actually, and is sensitive to neutron interactions, via pulse shape, you can't actually differentiate a neutron and a gamma ray uh, event like we can see here. Uh, however, they have um, figured out that if you uh, mix in, um, I believe, what is it? Uh, a fluorescent compound, it's a uh, diphenyl loxavol, uh, PPO, and then there's another one, DPA, um, as dyes into the uh, plastic matrix, you can actually make them pole shape discrimination capable, which is something very interesting. And if you're interested in learning more about that, we'll probably have it in a future lecture, but also definitely go check out these papers. Next, we'll talk about um, inorganic scintillators. So organic scintillators, carbon-based. Inorganic scintillators, not carbon-based. Um, some general properties of these scintillators. Uh, the atomic number tends to be much higher than organic scintillators. Um, you can see here, for instance, sodium iodide uh, telluride, and we'll talk about that, um, or cesium iodide. Uh, these tend to be much higher Z and also tend to have much higher density. So I actually have some of the properties of sodium iodide telluride here listed, where it has a density of 3.67 grams per centimeter cube, so roughly 
3.67 times more dense than your average organic scintillator, and the light output tends to be much higher. So we're getting about 40,000 photons per MeV of energy deposition versus um, with the uh, organic scintillators, we're get, getting much lower. So what this ends up meaning is that we can uh, more accurately identify um, monoenergetic sources of radiation because we're getting more statistics relative to those sources of radiation. Our probability of those gamma rays in this case interacting with our material is also much higher because we're both at a higher density and we're at a uh, higher Z. In addition, we can get the full energy deposition because we can because we have a much greater probabil probability of photoelectric absorption occurring. And here you can just get an idea of these are some of the uh, inorganic scintillators that we've worked with here in our lab at Michigan. And then a uh, really cool photo from uh, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where they do a bunch of growing of inorganic scintillators. So what is the scintillation mechanism uh, with these scintillators? So um, in these, uh, the scintillation mechanism uh, depends on the energy state of the crystal lattice. So uh, these are broken down into a valence band and a conduction band, where the valence band um, electrons are bound actually to the lattice sites, and then conduction band the electrons have the electrons have sufficient energy to migrate uh, through the crystal. Now uh, you can see a, a diagram of this here where we have some band gap between the valence band and the conduction band. As a charged particle moves through this crystal, uh, we can get electrons moved from this valence band are transferred enough sufficient energy to move from the valence band into this conduction band. Eventually, those will de-excite, giving off light that can be collected. Um, however, this light tends to be in the UV range depending on the crystal. So what's generally done is they add an activator. In this case, that's an impurity added to the crystal to create special excited states. And you can see that in the valent in this diagram here of that kind of activator. So when we show, um, for instance, sodium iodide telluride or cesium iodide sodium, this sodium or this telluride is on, um, or uh, selenium for instance, is acting as that activator and altering the uh, valence band conduction band structure such that we can get uh, visible light photons. Um, and it can also, one of the nice properties of this is it can also be used to tailor uh, the wavelength of photons that are emitted. So cesium iodide sodium has a different wavelength emission than cesium iodide telluride, for instance. And that can be used to um, better acquire the light that we want. Uh, something to notice or something to note here is that the singlet states for the organic scintillators decay on the order of nanoseconds. Um, for uh, this one, uh, for, sorry, um, for inorganic scintillators, um, they decay much, much slower on the order of 30 to 500 nanoseconds, for instance. Um, why would an electron uh, why would an electron be in triplet state instead of singlet state, by the way? Th oh, thallium. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, be in a triplet state instead of a singlet state. Um, I believe both states are created upon excitation of the molecules. Why one is preferred over the other or how both are created off the top of my head, I am not sure. Um, but a quick comparison um, between some organic and inorganic to give you a rough idea of some comparisons. So light yield, generally the inorganics are going to have higher light yield. Density, generally they're going to have a higher density. They're also going to have a higher Z, better for that gamma ray interaction. Uh, for the scintillator response, the organics tend to be much, much faster in that we're looking at a two to four nanosecond response time versus the inorganics tend to be 30 to 5 500 nanoseconds. Um, one of the things that uh, for an engineering standpoint that we really care about is are they hygroscopic, meaning does humidity or water uh, mess with them in any way? So you can notice uh, in the image, oh, nope, 
not that one. In the image that I showed here, most of these scintillators are encased. And they're encased such that humidity, things of that nature do not impact them, which we don't necessarily, um, hold on one second, sorry, which we don't necessarily uh, think about, but for engineering considerations, for cons design considerations, and then also accounting for light transport, they do matter greatly. Um, as terms, as in terms to the sensitivity to fast neutrons, um, organic scintillators tends to be much more sensitive. I say no for inorganic. You can absolutely detect uh, fast neutrons um, with inorganic scintillators, but it's generally under different circumstances or reactions that you're looking for. And then full gamma ray energy deposition, which is related to the Z for the organics, not really, but for the inorganics, yes. Um, question um, about what do you mean by response time? So by response time, I mean uh, the time that it takes for all of the light to be emitted. So I believe these are the values that are used in an exponential decay, for instance. So uh, the point being that the scintillator response for the organics decays much, much faster than that for the inorganics. And you get more of all of the light over a shorter time period. All right, uh, so now that we have our light produced, how do we detect it? Um, so traditionally, um, the scintillators are coupled directly to what is called a photomultiplier, detect photomultiplier tube or um, some kind of photo detector. And you can see a rough setup of one here where we have our scintillator that is then coupled to this entire thing is called a photomultiplier tube. And this gives us some electrical response that we can digitize and get our output waveform. So let's break down uh, this detector first. So the first thing to note is that we need to be able to collect light and we need to be able to convert that into uh, something that uh, is useful, in this case, an electrical charge. Um, so this is done via on the photocathode, uh, via photoelectric effect. So the incident photons that are produced from our scintillator come in and they will interact with the photocathode and produce an electron. And this has a quantum efficiency roughly on the 20 to 30% range, uh, depending of course on the spectra. And of course you want your spectra to be able to um, match your detector. So in this case, um, if we have EJ200, this is our emission spectrum for optical, for optical photons. And then we have our efficiency for, in this case, um, a type of photomultiplier tube. And we can see that these match relatively well in that uh, we'll get the majority, we'll be able to collect the majority of light. Now we see here that these electrons do not necessarily go on straight tracks and they interact with what is called a dynode. Um, these straight tracks are, these electrons are actually focused through electrodes uh, to guide them to this dynode. And this is a um, portion of the photomultiplier tube that when these electrons interact with it, what will happen is these electrons will produce additional electrons and you get a cascade and multiplication effect. And generally for any type of photomultiplier tube, it will have a cascade of dynodes that um, has a huge range depending on what type of gain they're looking for. But you can see the visualization here where we have, let's say, three um, photoelectrons produced uh, that go towards our first dynode stage and are focused. Um, they then have some multiply multiplication that then gets multiplied down until all the way we get some overall gain of our system. And you can see mathematically, based off of the number, the number of dynodes um, and the uh, production of uh, the dyno production, we get some overall gain for a detector from uh, just a single uh, interaction. And this ends up giving us our pulse output. A uh, quick question, what do you mean by response time? Sorry for going back to the previous question, but what is the physics behind fast and slow decay of organic and inorganic scintillators? Um, that is a very good question. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know why um, why the structure difference between the two. I have a feeling it's uh, 
due to uh, the conduction band and the uh, valence band versus the excited states of the molecules in the organic scintillators. I would bet it has something to do with that, um, but off the top of my head, I do not know um, why one fundamentally is faster than the other. Good question, something I need to look into. Um, but this is the general response from a photomultiplier tube that we use um, to acquire uh, output pulses. Um, photomultiplier tubes are not the only th photo detector out there. Um, the other one that you'll hear more about are from how much, oh, sorry, how much time stretching due to PMT. Um, in terms of the time it takes uh, between the interaction and the uh, actual cascade down the photomultiplier tube. Now time spread. Um, time stretching due to PN, now time spread. I will definitely say that is, uh, if you hit with a delta function in time, what do you get out? Uh, that's definitely going to be PMT dependent. Um, uh, off the top of my head, um, I am not uh, certain what that on what order that tends to be. Uh, generally, it, for timing applications um, that we've worked with, we'll have the same types of PMTs that are used, such that if there is some delay or some time it takes from that interaction to get an output, that because we're using the same detector system, that that is not an issue, um, and that is uh, taken into account. Um, so one other type of photo detector I'm going to talk about um, that has become relatively new um, are silicon photomultipliers. So SIPM, silicon photomultipliers, are composed of arrays of avalanche photodiodes operated in Geiger mode, um, where each one of these avalanche photodiodes produces a constant output from a microcell, and the summation of lots and lots of microcells firing gives an output pulse. So as an example here, you can see this is uh, from Sensel is the company, J series is the iteration designation for this silicon photomultiplier, um, and it's composed of these six millimeter by six millimeter uh, cells. Each one of these, uh, pi or six millimeter by six millimeter pixels, each one of these pixels is um, composed of about 22,300 microcells, where you can see this then breaks down one of these pixels into its subcomponents down to the microcells. And these tend to be on the uh, micrometer order of size. They're very small. And you can see a cross-section of a potential design of one of these detectors, where you have an active uh, area or an avalanche region in between here, where if you have an incident photon interact with that, you have some voltage across this that is in the breakdown region of this PN junction, such that any perturbation causes it to fire and to move through. So that if a light particle or photon then interacts with it, it causes this firing to happen and you get a just constant output pulse. So you can think of this like with the uh, Geiger counter that was shown uh, many slides ago where it didn't matter what energy particle went into it, you got a constant output pulse. The same idea applies here, that you get some constant output pulse for the photon. And because we've got, say, 22,000 of these microcells, they of course have some efficiency, but if you then have a scintillator response where you're getting like 10,000 photons that can then interact uh, with all of these microcells, you can get a proportional response to the amount of light that is collected. Um, and we'll do a comparison between these two real quick, but uh, two quick questions. Uh, question on PMT. What happens if photomultiplier tube is left at high humidity for a long period of time? Um, very good question. Uh, so I am not familiar with 
any response of photomultiplier tubes themselves to humidity. Um, generally, uh, photomultiplier tubes are very temperature dependent and they are also very dependent to or sensitive to magnetic fields. Um, as opposed to humidity, I have not seen any literature to suggest um, humidity substantially affects them. I would expect humidity would more so affect the scintillator that it's coupled to, but good question. Um, along the lines of PMTs, are microchannel plates common for radiation detection? Uh, yes, absolutely, microchannel plates are common for radiation detection. Um, on, that's one uh, topic that, as I said at the beginning, where this is not um, over all detection types and all detection mechanisms, that is absolutely another detection uh, uh, detector that can be used. Um, so uh, comparing for PMTs and SIPMs, uh, as in terms of gain, uh, PMTs, uh, again, were developed, I believe, during the 60s, um, if not earlier to some degree. Uh, and they have been around for a while, and they can be very versatile. So you can have a huge range of gains. You can have a huge range of efficiencies, um, a huge range of timing properties, things of that nature. They're very good for um, that kind of stuff. However, um, to give you an idea, generally this is about a six millimeter by six millimeter area um, versus these PMTs tend to be um, on the order of, let's, of, can't do the conversion from inches to centimeters in my head, but let's say on the order of like six to eight inches. So these tend to be much, much larger than silicon photomultipliers. So something to keep in mind there. Um, uh, SIPMs tend to have a lower highest gain, um, but that is something that it has been moving on and that they're working on. Um, something to note is that uh, generally the quantum efficiency or the efficiency of SIPMs does tend to be a little bit higher. Um, and that I know is something they're working on to push the boundaries of. Um, in terms of applied voltage, again, this is an engineering application. Um, PMTs take high voltage. Um, SIPMs, a nice thing about them is that they take low voltage. So in that terms of application, um, PMTs are also sensitive to magnetic fields. Um, you might ask why that is. So if we look at this, we have cascades of electrons moving through a vacuum and we get this multiplication. So if you can imagine a magnet putting next to this, that's going to change the course of these electrons. Um, and thus they're not going to go to the dynodes and that can cause issues. So generally PMTs are shielded with mu metals such that um, that isn't really an issue. Um, another consideration is also the capacitance, uh, which both relates to the noise and then also relates to the detector response. So here, uh, this is a scintillation pulse from a, a photomultiplier tube. And we can see that it maxima, it seems to be less than 100 nanoseconds in width. Uh, we can see, going back a couple slides real quick, uh, this is the response from a photomultiplier tube, and we can see that this, these pulses are almost upwards of a microsecond, at least uh, 600 nanoseconds or more. And we, they, so PMs generally will give um, much faster or much longer pulses, and that has to do with the response of that detector. So um, in summary, uh, we've discussed uh, proportional counters, uh, talked about scintillators, organic and inorganic, and discussed some photodetectors, some photomultiplier tubes, and silicon photomultipliers. Uh, thank you all very much for your time, and if there are any other questions, I will gladly uh, try to address them. Uh, no, PSD is uh, very practical with uh, silicon photomultipliers. Um, as, so as that, uh, as this shows, um, we can definitively see a difference between the two particle type interactions. And that's largely due to the uh, Different, that's largely due to the response of the scintillator as opposed to the detector. Um, 
in terms of the acquisition rate, for instance, so pulse length, uh, it matters for two reasons, uh, two primary reasons, the acquisition uh, length that you have to acquire. And then um, if you're in a high uh, radiation area or high field environment, it can cause pile up and you can get pulse overlapping and things like that. That's where the length of these pulses uh, begins to matter. What happens when inorganic or what happens when humidity gets into your inorganic scintillators? I believe they get, I believe the crystal gets very cloudy and light can't transport it through, transport through it easily. Um, because we have a broken open uh, sodium iodide detector in our department and you can clearly not see through it. Will SIPM eventually take over um, from, for, uh, from sodium iodide PMTs? So we can absolutely couple sodium iodide to an SIPM. Um, I think it fully depends on the application and what uh, fully depends on the application and what it's being used for. Um, if you want something small and compact, uh, generally, uh, SIPMs can be a better choice. However, if you need a very fast response time um, with good spectroscopic capabilities, the PMT might be the better choice. Uh, something else to note here is that uh, these SIPMs being six by six millimeters to get good light collection uh, from them, generally uh, you need a scintillator to match that area. Um, which can be an engineering challenge to do. There are uh, groups that have shown uh, these entire pixel arrays can just be coupled to a large crystal and then summed. Uh, however, that creates even longer pulses. And while those have been shown to be comparable in energy resolution to uh, photomultiplier tubes, there are other um, issues with doing that. So will PMs eventually take over from PMTs? Uh, potentially, but there are still trade-offs for using one versus the other. I might have missed it, but how can you know energy of the radiation with SIPM when it operates in Geiger mode? Excellent question. Um, so uh, by Geiger mode, we're talking about these uh, individual avalanche photodiodes. So each one of these uh, six millimeter by six millimeter pixels has about 22,000 microcells on it, where each one of these microcells is an avalanche photodiode operated in Geiger mode. So if you think about it this way, let's say we have an organic scintillator coupled to it and uh, we get one MAV of deposition that produces 10,000 photons. Um, theoretically, there's some efficiency to that collection, but uh, we can theoretically, if we have 100% efficiency, we can collect all 10,000 of those photons. Uh, each one of those photon interactions produces uh, some charge. And let's say that our net output charge is then 10,000 times that charge value. If we then have a different energy radiation particle interact with our uh, scintillator, let's say it's half an MeV, so we get 5,000 neutrons or 5,000 photons, sorry. Um, those 5,000 photons are 100% um, uh, collected, so we then get 5,000 uh, times some charge value given off by the avalanche photodiode. Um, yes, that is 5,000 times that charge value. So the 10,000 value will be greater than the 5,000 value. And that's how we can do that differentiation between the two. Um, it should be noted that uh, this kind of alludes to that, but there's 22,000 microcells here. Um, so eventually, theoretically, if you have uh, something with very high light output, uh, you can overload these microcells. Um, and that should be something of note so that as you go over, I go up to higher light output values, um, then you can overwhelm this IPM and you'll get nonlinear responses at very high uh, light output values. And that is another drawback to uh, SIPMs uh, compared to photomultiplier tubes. 
do you or anyone have good recommendation for an introductory text for those who are new to the nuclear engineering subject? Absolutely. Um, I think I had it on one of these slides. Yes. Uh, radiation and detection measurements by uh, Professor Glenn F. Knoll. Um, yes. Uh, Written right there, exactly, yeah. Um, that is for all of us in radiation detection at the University of Michigan, um, that is our go-to book. Um, is it possible for each of the SIPM to go beyond 20,000 microcells? Um, I believe they are working on that. Um, as of right now, this is um, I'm not for, so this is from uh, Sensel, uh, which is a company out of Ireland that produces these, and these are what we work with. Um, there's another company out of uh, Japan called Hamamatsu that I know they have a competitor to this iteration of SIPM. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure how many microcells they have though. Um, yes, theoretically, you would just have to go to a smaller um, microcell like width. Uh, but I think there are trade-offs in doing that, which is why they, there's some optimization in the number of microcells. All right, and with that, uh, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, if you have additional questions, uh, feel free to stay and listen and I'll address them. Um, but I think this concludes the lecture. Um, so, a couple other questions. Uh, do you know what are the trade-offs? Um, so, uh, so uh, one of the major ones is going to be crosstalk. So, uh, another uh, interesting uh, uh, draw, I don't want to call it a drawback, but an interesting effect with uh, silicon photomultiplier tubes is that occasionally if you get uh, one microcell firing, you can actually, that will uh, cause a perturbation that causes additional microcells to fire. Um, so I know that uh, this can be a huge signal of noise and a huge signal of uncertainty in the response of silicon photomultipliers. So I know that the microcell size and how they form that structure directly uh, links to the crosstalk and then the noise of the detector. So I would bet that the microcell has to uh, deal with the microcell size uh, scales probably with the crosstalk and the probability of crosstalk. Um, I'm sure Sensel and Hamamatsu probably on their data sheets, you could see that as they uh, change the microcell size, what the dark noise or dark rate, uh, how that changes with the detector. Um, and that's something you could absolutely look into. What is the best radiation detector for the layperson's everyday use? Um, I would uh, say, what are you trying to detect? Because uh, it's uh, very dependent on that. Uh, if you really want to detect gamma rays super well, um, uh, if you want to detect uh, gamma rays super well um, at ve with very high precision, then I would go with um, a a uh, CZT crystal or high purity germanium crystal, something of that nature. If you want bulk efficiency for your money with decent resolution, then you want an inorganic scintillator. If you want thermal neutron detection, then um, you want some kind of thermal neutron detector like a helium-3 detector. If you care about fast neutron detection, then you want an organic scintillator. Um, if you care about identifying new fast neutrons, then you want um, something like Stillbean or EJ276, which is pulse shape discrimination capable, uh, something of that nature. So it's, it's very, um, detectors tend to be very highly specialized for their uh, applications. So in terms of general detectors, if you want something that's really fun, um, something that we uh, 
uh, do um, when we have students uh, visit or um, we have done this when we've uh, done uh, workshops at Oak Ridge is just using Geiger counters or basic detectors to go out and find sources. And if you're looking for sources that uh, we've like placed in the room or hidden in the room to simulate a finding a source scenario, um, in terms of something like that, a Geiger counter just works great. But if you want more information about a source, then you need to go to these more uh, complex detectors. No problem. All right, I'll hang out uh, here if there are any more questions um, for a couple more minutes. If not, thank you all very much. sharing and